book of Acts. And, and actually, we've been going through one particular story for about a month. And it started back when, when Peter and John were, were walking to the temple and they came into this, uh, this beggar, this crippled man, who was at the, the gate called Beautiful. And it, it was a man who had been crippled since birth. He was 40 years old. And this is a guy that, that probably for most of those 40 years had been there begging every single day. He was not at an age where he would naturally just be like, hey, I feel better now. I think I can walk. Right? So, 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 you know, he, he looks upon Peter and John. Peter and John, you know, tell him to look at them and they offer him not silver or gold, but in the name of Jesus, they heal him. And it creates this big spectacle. He, he, he goes with them and, and worships God with them. And as they're leaving the temple gates, there's a big crowd wondering what's going on. And so Peter proclaims before them that it was in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, this servant, this, this person that had been like prophesied for, for, for centuries, for, for thousands of years, people uh, that have been waiting for this one person to come. He had come and he had died. And they proclaim this gospel message that he died for this. And he died, and, and it's in the power of that name that this man was healed. And you too can have that, that, you know, that lordship of him over you. You too can experience him healing your life. You too can experience that time of refreshing that he offers. And they proclaim that to the people, and the, the crowd just... You know, they continue to, to grow and grow, and, and, and the church grows and grows to, to exponential numbers. And all of a sudden, the authorities come in, they're like, what's going on? We thought we got rid of this, this Jesus movement. We thought it ended when we killed him. And so they take Peter and John, they put them in jail. And then they put them on trial before them, and Peter and John stand there firmly in front of them. And then these officials look, and, and they see these uneducated not very well dressed, not very eloquent people in front of them, but they also see that these men had been with Jesus. Right? And these men stand firmly where they are. Even though these were the same people that had sentenced Jesus to death, they stand firm to what they know is right. And they say there's no other name but the name of Jesus in which you can be saved. And what could they do? The authorities couldn't do anything. So they let them go. That's where we're at at this point. We, we've been talking about this for a month. That's a very quick summary of what has happened in the past two chapters of the book of Acts. And we're getting to the latter part of chapter 4. And so, um, actually, we're going to try to reenact this. Because if you actually read how it is, there's a part where the people erupt in prayer. I don't know if you did, like, a lot of people argue whether this is what really happened, because it's kind of creepy if it, if it was, where everyone just erupts and they're all saying the same thing. I don't know, but we're going to reenact it just for the heck of it, okay? So, um, I'm going to read the, the passage, but when we get to the part where the prayer happens, with the quotation marks, I want everyone to read with me at those points, okay? And you're going to be like, whoa, this is weird. <laughs> if that's what really what happened. Anyway, regardless, let's go ahead and start. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Everybody. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why did the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I can read this. <laughs> After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So that's what happened. After all of this had happened, the healing had happened, there was a proclamation of the gospel, thousands of people were saved, 
the authorities came in and, and they tried to threaten Peter and John and told them, no longer use this name. And they said, you know what? We aren't afraid of you. Who are we to not speak of what God has done in our lives? We do not fear man. We do not fear death. We only fear the Lord. And now we, we get to this point. They come back to their friends. And they tell them everything that's happened. And their friends erupt in this prayer. Right? Kind of interesting. We're going to kind of unpack a little bit about what goes on there. And then you have this big scene where the room is shaken. God answers that prayer. And you see a new boldness. Anyway. Now with all that set up, I'm going to kind of get silly and unusual, and you guys are probably going to not listen to anything I say for the rest of the message. So when I see, the, whenever I read this passage, um, it, it kind of takes me to a particular song. And I know there's at least one or two people that might know this song. Um, but, you know, it, it's, for me, the, the song came out in 1993. I was in high school. Um, and every time I read this passage, I'm sorry, it, this dates me back to, to who I am and, 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 you know, whatever. But I, I, I read this passage... And this song starts playing in my head. And it's just going in my head. And the whole time I'm like bobbing around. And the thing is, I don't even like like this kind of music, right? But anyway. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Uh, <laughs> you guys know Will Smith, obviously. But before he was Will Smith, he was a Fresh Prince. And then he also became the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. It's a TV show that was very popular from 1990 to 1996 my years of like high school and some of my college years. And um, before he was this actor, before he was this huge mega movie star, he was a rapper, right? And, and this was their last song they actually released together. After this, Will became a, a, a solo artist, and this was their last single that they released together. And it was Boom, Shake the Room, right? Go something like, boom, shake, shake, shake the room. Boom, shake, shake, shake the room. Tick, tick, tick. Tick, boom. <laughs> so every time I read this passage, I can't help but have this going on in my head the whole time. And you you got to understand, I don't, I don't really know, listen to this kind of music, but this, this, that, that catchphrase just kind of sticks with you, right? And, and so that, that's what's going on in my head every time I read this passage. I'm just saying, boom, shake, shake the room, right? So, yeah, I'm weird. <laughs> I think everything I say after this point, you're probably going to be like, what's he talking about? This guy's listening to hip-hop music. You don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> anyway, um, for, for me, like, yeah, that, that phrase catches my eye. The, the, the shaking of the room. And so, with that, you know, when you guys read this passage later on, you guys can YouTube this song, and you guys are, are more than welcome to also have that song playing in, in your back of your head. But regardless, moving on. Um, you know, again, this was actually really a follow-up to our last message. This again is, is adversity is coming in. For the first time, there's opposition against this, this Christian movement. And I really could have called this, you know, in the face of adversity part two. But instead I chose Boom Shake the Room. <laughs> anyway, all right. I'm just going to be laughing about myself for a while. Okay, so let's get into the passage. Okay, let me unpack a little bit about what's going on. I'm going to apply it to us in a second. But when you really look at what happens, Peter and John come back. They share everything that happened. And the first thing the people do is they pray together. Now, whether it happened where everyone all of a sudden by the Spirit of God started to speak the same words, I don't know. Most scholars think it was probably one person who spoke and everyone was praying in agreement. Regardless, there was a prayer. And it happened in a corporate setting where all of them were together. Brothers and sisters, what I, I, I want to really connect with you here is that praying together is extremely important. We saw this in the beginning of the book of Acts in Acts 1, right after Jesus went up to heaven. They didn't know what to do, so they did the only thing that they could do, and they prayed together. So it's in moments of despair, moments of uncertainty, that the people of God come together and pray in the book of Acts. And so I want us also as a people of God not to lose that, that sight of, of praying together. You know, you've heard those, those silly catchphrases that, you know, a church that prays together stays together. Right? I'm sure some of you have heard something like that. There's truth to that. 
I, honestly, in, in all the ministries that I've been in, there's a strong correlation. If you see a lot of people that are fervently praying, that usually means ministry is doing really well. For myself, I was doing a lot of campus ministry. Our church really focused on university students. And the measuring stick that I could tell, if we were doing well as a church, you could tell because our prayer meetings had a lot of people coming out. There's always a strong correlation between prayer and, I guess, spiritual health when it comes to a church. And so, um, you know, I, I tried to, you know, we're trying to kick off a prayer meeting. I know the timing isn't the best. Right now it's at Saturday at noon. I know that's a terrible time. Um, and so I'm questioning whether we need to change that time. But regardless, I want us as a church to be one that's committed to praying together. There's something special about corporate prayer. Now at the same time, corporate prayer, praying together as a group, should never substitute your individual prayer life. But as a community, as a church, it's very important for us to spend time praying with each other and for each other. And so I think you know, this, this church here, these, this group of believers, models that well, that the first thing they did after they heard all of these stories about how adversity had come was that they prayed together. I don't want us to lose sight of that. Okay? So let's, let's pray together. <laughs> All right, that's kind of an idea. All right. Um, the, the thing that they did, though, in their prayer, the first thing that they noticed was, or the first thing they acknowledged was that God is sovereign. They call him sovereign Lord. They talk about how he created everything. Now think about what just happened. Something bad had just happened. They had reason to be just upset. They had reason to be discouraged. But the first thing they claimed is that, God, you are above all things. God, you allowed this to happen. And they, they quote from Psalm 2. And they even say, you know, all these things that we're seeing right now, Herod, Pontius Pilate, uh, our own leaders, all these things that we're seeing right now, you, you proclaimed it already in Scripture. This was going to happen. But it's happening because you're allowing it to happen, because you are sovereign. I don't want to get too theological because, you know, people could look at this and get into the whole, like, Carmen, or Cal Calvinism and Arminian debate. I don't want to get into that right now. But, but what is very clear in this passage is that this early church really believed that God was in control. And I think many times when we're in a similar circumstance, when we face opposition, when we face struggles, the first thing that we start doing is we get angry. We start blaming God. And we start questioning God. But what you see in this case is rather than questioning, rather than being angry with God, we see a people that are claiming and proclaiming who God is. And they're saying, God, you're powerful. You're sovereign. You're in control. So I, I want us to remember that no matter what happens in our lives, God's still in control. God is still sovereign. And he has promised us that there is nothing that will ever be too great for us. He's always going to give us a way to stand up under it, right? So when you look at their prayer, these are the things they did not do. They didn't ask for that opposition to end. They didn't ask for God to, to mess up the plans of the people that were working against them. They didn't even ask for protection. It's kind of unusual. For us, often, if something like that happens where, where we are facing opposition, where we are facing adversity, we typically ask for God to make it stop. <laughs> if we're suffering, we're like, God, ah, take it away. If people are giving us trouble, we're like, God, just, you know, get them out of my life or, or you know, mess them up or something. That's our natural reaction. And yet the people of God here do none of that. They never ask for God to, to keep them away from these things. If anything, they're inviting for more of it. Brothers and sisters, if, if anyone ever told you that becoming a follower of Christ, becoming a believer in God, would mean a, like a life absent of suffering, they were lying to you. We got, we got more, our missionary back there laughing. Um, but, you know, if anything, life with God 
usually means more suffering. Usually. Now, at the same time, Scripture tells us it's easier. My yoke is light. My yoke is easy. Because He's with us. But it doesn't mean there's not going to be any suffering. And again, I've talked about this before, but I think many times we look at our lives and we feel, if we minimize the amount of suffering in my life, I'm doing well. The less suffering I have, the better my life will be. I remember when I was, uh, I was in about high school. I was in high school, I went to this, you know, this, this Korean American church, and this is a very well-off church, right? You would, I remember as a kid, I, I, I liked walking around the parking lot because I would see nice cars that I never saw anywhere else. Right? Like some of our people, like we had some young doctors, there was these two young doctors that I guess graduated for John, Johns Hopkins, like my school, my church was very close to Johns Hopkins. They both had like matching Mazda RX-7s. Right, these little sports cars, and they would, they would come in together, and I, lo I loved how that sports car looked. There'd be a silver one and a red one right next to each other, all the time. I said, like, cool! And I would look, and there would be like BMWs, Mercedes, all these nice cars. We drove a Chevy Astro van um, <laughs> that actually ended up catching on fire and exploding in, my park, in, in our driveway. Uh, that, that, that actually happened to me. Well, well, how old was I? I think I was, oh yeah, I was, I was maybe like ninth or 10th grade. I remember my, my parents waking me up it was like 6 a.m. I was like, what's going on? I, actually, I think it was middle school. Eighth grade, eighth grade. So I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, hey, hey, the car's on fire. I'm like, what are you talking about? And then they rushed me out, and our van was literally on fire. And like the, 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 the fire department had come. They were worried. So they actually had us like stand behind the house because they were worried that if it exploded, if the fire got to the gas tank, that it would destroy the house. And so we were standing behind our house, 6 a.m., Freezing cold, right? shivering, and I hear, a, I hear a pop sound. It turns out the oil tank had blown up. And I actually looked at my feet when the, when the pop happened. And the, the cap to the oil, the oil tank actually rolled up to my feet smoking. I don't know how that happened. I was behind the house, right? I, I don't even know how physically that's, that's possible, but, but this little oil cap rolls up and I was like, whoa. <laughs> And they actually got the fire out before it got to the gas tank. So thank goodness, otherwise our garage probably would have been destroyed. Um, <laughs> and I remember this because afterwards, everyone in my neighborhood, all of a sudden I became popular. Because right? they're like, dude, what happened in front of your house? Because they could see this like black skeleton of a car in front of my house. And so like, they all came over and they wanted to check it out. Because they'd never seen a burned down car before, neither did I. <laughs> That's the kind of car I had. And I even remember the same very car in the church parking lot. I was, me and my friend were like skipping Sunday school. So we were like hiding out in my car, just like kind of sitting low so no one would see us. And I, I guess we were fascinated with the cigarette lighter. So we just kept turning it on and off. We are like, ooh, this is so cool. And I, I don't know, we weren't burning anything. We were just kind of playing with it. But it turns out we had used it so much that my dad's car wouldn't start. <laughs> we drained the battery. <laughs> These are my memories of my car. It's a, it's a total, like, tongcha, right? It's a piece of crap. Everyone else had nice cars. I mean, I went on a very random change. <laughs> so, so everyone has nice cars, and actually, most of the people my age went to a, like a very nice private school called Gilman. Okay. Now, my my grade, I guess, was kind of the turning point. In my uh, in my church, because the people below me all went to state school. They all went to like University of Maryland. They didn't really like reach for the stars, I guess, in terms of their education. However, the the people above me, they were all private school kids, so they all went to Ivy League schools. So it was kind of weird, right? We had like kind of a like I was right in the middle, right? And so I had all these guys that were on their way to Ivy League schools, and the the class above us, I happened to know the Sunday school teacher, and he used to tell me, you know what? I'm praying that my kids learn how to suffer. He was actually praying for more suffering in their lives as their Sunday school teacher. And I was like, that's weird. That's crazy. You want your kids to suffer more? And he's like, they, they, don't, they never suffered in their lives. They need to learn what life is like. At the time, I didn't understand. But now I do. Is that suffering, honestly, is an important aspect of your life. It builds character. It builds perseverance. It allows us to trust God more. And so what I'm telling you is, 
if you're a believer in Christ, there's going to be more suffering in your life. But know there's a purpose behind it. And don't ever buy a Chevy Astro van. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's known for catching on fire because another friend of mine bought the same type of car for a, a, a world tour or a road tour. Like He had a band. And it also caught on fire and destroyed all of his instruments. So, <laughs> if, you, if you don't remember anything else from the sermon, never buy a Chevy Astro van. Okay, so... Moving onward. So what did they ask for? They didn't ask for the end of suffering. They didn't ask for protection. But they asked that God would allow them to speak the word, to proclaim the gospel boldly. They also asked for God to actually work through signs and wonders through the name of Jesus. These are interesting requests because they're very contrary to what we would normally do if we're in the same situation. If you are facing suffering, you would normally ask for God, get that suffering out of my life. But instead, they're asking for God to allow them to do the very thing that is causing that suffering. Every time they spoke and proclaimed the gospel, they were getting more suffering. But they're saying, God, let us do it even better. That's the heart of the early church. They knew very clearly that their main purpose was to proclaim Jesus. Their main purpose was to share the good news. All that other stuff was secondary to that. And so they said, Lord, Sovereign Lord, help us do this better. Help us to be even more bold. And what happens? God responds. Boom, shake, 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 shake the room. Okay? The room shakes. And, I, and I've heard stories even of modern churches today that have experienced the same thing. That in the middle of a prayer meeting, they felt God shake the room. As a confirmation of their prayers. Ah, you know, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But I know people have, have proclaimed that the, the similar things happen. God does give those type of confirmations when He wants to. So he responds. And not only does the room shake, but immediately they're proclaiming the gospel boldly. So you know that what they had asked for had happened because immediately it started to happen. So how do we respond to this? You know, I think when we look at a passage like this, it's hard to relate. Because I think in Christianity today, in the church today, we don't feel that same pressure, we don't feel that same urgency that the early church did. You know, if we were living in North Korea, it'd be a different matter entirely. But living where we are, we're not persecuted in the same way. But one of the things that I really want you to understand today is that we still live in persecution. It's just different. There's still a target on our back. But we don't even realize that we're getting persecuted every day. That's the, that's the sneaky thing about church today. Is that it's happening, but we're just kind of going with the flow, not noticing that it's happening. You know, unfortunately, part of this is, is kind of, you know, exacerbated by, by the things that we do as a church. Like, honestly, you know, looking at the news of the Korean church today, it's not, it's not very happy, right? You know, you have stories about... You have full gospel. You have stories about how you You have stories about these very big churches that are going through a lot of scandals and crises right now. And unfortunately, this is the only thing that people hear about. So when they think about the Korean church, they think about these negative things that are in the news right now. And unfortunately, we're doing it to ourselves to an extent. And so nowadays, it's very easy for people. Like before, if you were a Christian, it, it kind of meant something, but now it's like, oh, you're a Christian, okay, that's kind of cool. If anything, it's kind of looked down upon. Growing up in the States, you know, the, the way that the church has gone in the States is it's, it's become what they call a post-church culture, where, where everybody understands about the church and Christianity to an extent, but it's kind of seen as like, oh, we, we've done that, right? Like church, church, you know, yeah, you go to church, it's good, you know, don't, don't kill people. So, so the, the idea is if you go to church, then you're kind of an idiot. And so you're just kind of just someone and like, you know, you, you're, you're trying to do like live a good life, but you're not necessarily that intelligent. That's, that's the mentality in the States today. 
and myself going to you know a very competitive school, that was the expression that I often felt. When I told people I was Christian, they like, oh, that's nice. Uh, oh, that's cute. <laughs> right? They're like, hey, why don't you come with me? Ah, oh, no, that's cool. <laughs> I have better things to do. Uh, I got my own spirituality. I had a roommate. He created his own religion. Right? He used to be Christian. And then one day he's like, you know what? I don't think I'm Christian anymore. I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Because basically, he read so much that he had taken little bits and pieces from all these different religions and made his own religion. He actually believed more in, I guess, pantheism, where he felt that we as a people were becoming more and more like God, as collectively. But it's weird because he agreed with me that man was sinful and fallen, so I, I didn't understand that. <laughs> but the thing was, the guy was a brilliant man, right? And so he had kind of created his own religion. And that's the type of persecution that we're getting right now, is that the church is an easy target, but one that we can't even really stand up for. If we do, we look foolish. If you look in the media, you look in the press, it's easy to knock the church. It's easy to say negative things about the church. You do that about any other religion, you do that about Islam, you're in trouble. <laughs> but you do that about other religions, you come out as like a bigot, as a, a racist, all these different types of things. But anyone can make fun of the church, and it's, it's like the cool thing to do. Uh, and that happens to us on a daily basis. For those of you that are university students, you're facing this type of persecution every day you go to school. You have professors that are telling you the thing that you believe in is, is a farce, it's a lie. There was a, there was a professor at the University of Texas, the, the university that our church used to be close to, he was, his name was Dr. White, and he always started off the class attacking Christianity. And for anyone that stood up against him, you usually failed that class. And I have students that got really messed up from that class because they would listen to the things that he would say, and he would purposely distort things and manipulate things to make Christianity look like, you know, this man-made religion. And many of these students who were, you know, very faithful Christians before that class had a lot of doubts and questions afterwards. There are people that are actively doing this, actively attacking the faith. Here in Korea, there's that cult that actually sends people into the church to destroy it. Right? That's crazy. There's persecution going on, we just don't see it. You know, they, they call this, this coming year the year of the Bible, meaning that there's actually a lot of movies coming out about the Bible this year. Son of God is playing in theaters in America right now. I know Noah with Russell Crowe is going to come out pretty soon. Um, Exodus with Christian Bale is coming out. Um, there's a movie about like the kid that, that went to heaven and came back. So he like died momentarily and came back. There's a movie about like, heaven is for real. I think that the movie's coming out. There's a lot of movies about God and the Bible that are coming out this year. They're calling it the year of the Bible. But what I can tell you is, unfortunately, a lot of those movies are actually going to raise more questions. And if anything, are probably going to make people less or more skeptical about the Bible, honestly. Like, Noah, I know, is based more upon a comic book than the Bible. Basically, the director, Darren Aronofsky, he wrote a comic book loosely based on the Bible. And he's shooting his movie based on that comic book. Okay? So those, there are these little verses that you can kind of interpret in weird ways. So, like, there's, like, the Nephilim. Like, who are the Nephilim? And so, in the movie, you're going to see weird things. I saw the trailer. There's, like, Noah with, like, a sword of fire going, ah, like this. And then, like, fire goes everywhere. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> and so, that movie's going to come out. People are going to watch it. And honestly, I think it's going to raise more questions than answers. So, again, people use the Bible. People use the church. People use Christianity. But in many ways, I think it's actually going to bring more negativity. So what I'm telling you is that you are living in a time of persecution. You just don't realize it. And so what did the people ask for? They asked for boldness to proclaim the gospel. One of the things I want us to understand is that when it comes to speaking the gospel, I know the sentiment right now is we kind of feel that if we just say the gospel as it is, it's not enough. Like, what, that's it? Is that going to be enough? And so there's a lot of evangelism techniques that try to, like, 
you know, make it more attractive or, or, or do different things to, to get people's attention. And so there's always this feeling for us as Christians, like, you know, I need to kind of spin the gospel in a way that, that would speak to someone now. But I think what this passage makes very clear is, number one, the ability to even proclaim the gospel with any type of power comes from the Holy Spirit alone. It doesn't come from our ability to come up with some clever new trick. I know people that would use, like, surveys. Right? They would come up to people and be like, hey, you know, I'm doing a survey, and they would film them, and they would ask them all these questions, but it was questions that would kind of lead them toward gospel-like questions. But the whole time I'm watching this, and this guy came to our church to teach us how to do this, I was like, this seems rather deceptive, because you're actually not taking a survey. <laughs> you're not going to publish whatever you're talking about. You're using this as a technique to get that person to where you want to talk to them, right? And I was like, if I was that person that figured that out, I'd be pretty upset, right? And like, I would like, like one day, I'm like, hey, someone's like, hey, you're on a video. What? Yeah, it's on YouTube. <laughs> and they go like, what is this? Like. Hey, he said he was taking a survey. <laughs> right? Like, that's so messed up, in my opinion. And so what I really want you to understand is that as they understood, you need the Holy Spirit. They also asked for God to work in, in signs and wonders. And that that's awesome too. Honestly, like, I actually feel that that you know we can ask God to work in separate in, in different ways and I actually feel that we're living in a different spiritual temperament where different things speak to different people regardless seek the Holy Spirit ask the Holy Spirit for boldness now when you think about what got these people in trouble and what gets us in trouble it's not necessarily about the things that we do Peter and John had healed a man who would ever say, don't heal that person? Right? But they were in trouble because of what they said afterwards. And brothers and sisters, that's what gets us in trouble is when we speak the gospel. And what I'm telling you is, we can't stop speaking the gospel. I know there are people out there that are like, well, oh, this is what I've heard. People out there that are like, the gospel is so controversial. Let's not say it. Why don't we just do things and love upon them? That's not the gospel. That's nice humanitarian work. But that's not the gospel. And there are things that other churches are doing that I think are great. But if they substitute proclaiming the gospel, then I have a problem with it. And so brothers and sisters, I want us to know that that is our first priority. Is to speak. Now, I've talked also about how God speaks through our actions, and that's very true. But the first thing is to speak. So we need to ask the Holy Spirit to open our mouths. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to give us those words. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to speak through us. With boldness, with confidence. The good news of Jesus Christ. That's our job. So, brothers and sisters, when adversity comes, when opposition comes, let's cling all the more to the Holy Spirit. Let's ask for that boldness to proclaim the good news. And maybe, just maybe, he'll boom, shake, shake the room. <laughs> let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. We pray, Lord, that, that this model, this example of the early church would give us courage, would give us strength. That we would not see this as, as some exception. That we would not see this as just a story. But that we would take that challenge. That we would seek more of the Holy Spirit in our lives to give us the boldness to speak your words. Give us that courage to do so. Give us that courage. Work and act in ways that, that bring people back to your good news. Lord, if you choose to work in a sign and wonder, I pray that it would be for the sake of the gospel. I pray that it would be for the sake of us being able to share more about Jesus.
Father, we thank you, Lord.